Thanks so much, Richard. All right, uh, closing in on the end here. Thanks, everybody. Um, so my name is James Lawler. I'm the host of the Climate Now podcast, uh, which focuses on the energy transition and a weekly deep dive with an expert on a wide range of topics. We produce about 130 episodes with probably several hundred interviews. Um, and Blue Engine, which is a technical advisory uh, organization that works with our partners to accelerate the sustainable industrial future. Um, so this panel is about emerging research and development trends in the energy transition. And I, before introducing our panelists, I just wanted to reflect on this idea of emerging. So you're standing, on a, you're standing by the train, you're waiting for the train, you're looking down the tracks, and far in the distance you see a train. And for a very long time, it doesn't look like it's moving very fast. And then suddenly, it does. And then suddenly, it's massive and it's whooshing past you. And in many respects, that's what you know, being in the midst of this energy transition feels like. You know, when we, look, when we reflect on sort of one, you know, one element, and there are many elements, or so, you know, solar, just 20 years ago, there were about you know, two and a half gigawatts of total installed capacity globally. Last year, that was about 1,200 gigawatts of total installed capacity. In China, that industry is growing 100% year over year, with about four times the capacity installed as the United States. Worldwide, we've got about 50% more solar capacity additions this past year than we did the year before. So we're in the midst of this, you know, and that's just one piece. We can talk about EVs, electrification, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're gonna ask our panelists to do today is kind of look beyond that, you know, this exponential growth and this change that we're seeing to what is, what is, what is now emerging? What are those trains that are, you know, still sort of distant on the horizon but will be fast approaching before we know it? And I think they're up to the task. So uh, joining me today are Terabai Antoon, who is program manager of the Energy and Homeland Security program at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which is one of our nation's preeminent national laboratories. Um, and uh, James, McCall, um, James McCall, who is a senior um, analyst at the National Renewable Energy Lab, where he focuses on technologies that are at the nexus of our food production system, um, energy production, and, 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 other, and other trends. So, so I wonder if, um, you know, Terabai can, can start with the, asking you the first question here. When you think about the, the, the amount of change that we are experiencing um, and just how hard it is to calibrate, you know, how quickly this is coming and, you know, technologies that just a few years ago seemed so improbable, you know, even the experts, you know, within Department of Energy, um, Energy Information Administration thought that it would take us till 2040, you know, to reach 20% renewables in power generation, and we surpassed that last year. What are some of the other technologies that you think about that feel like they're distant, but are maybe closer than we, than we realize? And how should, we, how should we think about those? And I'll join you guys. Um, okay, well, uh, thanks for the question. I'm, I'm happy to be here, by the way. This has been an amazing few hours. Very, time well spent. Um, so I think the renewable energy transition is well underway, but, uh, but I think that there are elements of it that are absolutely essential that we haven't yet solved. Uh, so we can generate uh, wind and solar and we can probably generate a lot more. But right now, I don't think we have the infrastructure to support utilization of that energy to a full extent. Uh, one of the big challenges is the ups and downs of renewable generation. We generate solar when the sun is shining, we generate wind when the wind is blowing, but we have no control over when the sun shines or when the wind blows. And so, we can generate abundant amounts of energy. What we need to be able to do is even out the bumps and make it possible to use that energy 24 hours a day, even when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. And uh, just by mistake, I crashed a hydro stores table. Hello, guys. Uh, this morning, and uh, they are working on compressed air storage, and I think we heard from their president earlier today. I think those kinds of technologies are going to be needed because it's not lithium-ion batteries that we need for grid-scale storage. We need 
uh, things that store a lot more energy and can dispatch it on demand and can do so efficiently enough to make it viable. Uh, so that's one element. Uh, the other element is the grid. I think that was another topic that was touched on earlier. If we electrify everything, we need our demand of the grid increases exponentially. And the infrastructure we have in place today is not capable of handling that. Uh, one of the changes that most people don't think about that really profoundly impact the grid infrastructure is this idea of distributed uh, energy generation. You know, the grid that exists is one that is based on a centralized energy generation model. So the electrons flow in one direction on the grid. Today, we generate electricity everywhere, on my roof, for example. And these electrons have to go every which way. And the hardware we use on the grid is really not entirely capable of, of admitting this kind of chaos. And so we need to upgrade the infrastructure. And as we do that, the grid will necessarily have to become much more smart because managing the chaos, we need to bring order into this. And by making the grid more smart, we also make it more vulnerable to cyber attacks. And so how can we, given that, how can we make the grid resilient so that we could take maximum advantage of renewable energies? So, Terabay, I know that you've modeled, um, you know, th these kinds of questions before in your work, like the grid expansion question and, and how we're going to do it and what the tools are going to be and their sort of rates of deployment. And I'm, I'm really curious about, you know, the, the numbers around the grid expansion and to what degree they take into account, let's say, other exponential trends, like the expansion of, of electric vehicles, for example. Each electric vehicle has about, you know, roughly 10 times the amount of energy storage than a Tesla Powerwall, right? So you're talking about a massive amount of distributed energy storage in that resource. And so when we think about scale of grid build out and we think about, you know, some of these other things, you know, and how, how, how likely it is, do you think, that that figure, 3 to 5x, is in fact what it will take in terms of the build-out of the, of the grid, given all of these other trends that are... Um, so I think that... Um, I, I, I think there are some aspects of this that we actually know. Yeah. But uh, other aspects really depend on how innovative we are in developing the solutions that are going to be practical to implement. And, and so I think the, the answers we have today are almost certainly wrong. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that they are good enough that we can, we can know in which direction we need to go. Right. And we can begin to prioritize investment. And I think the DOE is making a huge bet that we actually know enough that we can create the footprint of this grid of the future, of this energy transition. Yeah, and I'd love to come back to that, the role of the DOE. Um, but James, you, you know, you, you're looking at a really interesting combination of technologies in your work and how these various technologies can combine to produce more value. So where, opportunities where one plus one is more than two. And it would be great to hear, you know, what are, what are some of the most exciting things that you're working on in that vein? Yeah, thanks also, James. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here. Um, I think... I could, I'm in a lucky spot and that I'm one of the last speakers, so I get to kind of, to kind of incorporate a lot of different things. Um, and a few things that have not really been touched on so far is the, the absolute land transformation that is going to be needed to kind of meet goals. And then it's going to come at these kind of like massive trade-offs um, across the kind of the spectrum of energy, food, and water. And so I think that this aspect of how do we kind of make this transition according to the national goals is really kind of needs to kind of incorporate these different things. If we don't have the water to do this, then we don't have food. And if we don't have food, you know, this, 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 this gets back to basic needs. Uh, the, you know, speaking of the Department of Energy, there was a study to meet the electrification goals of the country and to kind of decarbonize the electric sector. That's going to be roughly 11 million acres of solar. And it's like 
of solar production to, um, at, the, at the highest scale. And for reference, the state of Maryland is 9 million acres. So this is a huge, massive land transformation and a lot of just absolute capital and kind of making sure that this is done in a just and equitable format is going to be very important. So that's a lot of my research looks at kind of the combination of solar and agriculture and kind of taking advantage of both of those sectors to kind of for kind of mutual benefits that we can go into a little bit later. The other big thing and part of the reason that I'm in Bakersfield um, is working with the California Renewable Energy Laboratory, Kern Community College District, and Bakersfield Community College about how do you use skill sets in traditional kind of energy economies, such as oil and coal communities, to help with this transition. Um, you know, I, my first job out of college was actually for ERA, so it's really great to see some of my old colleagues. Um, and the one thing that I think I learned during that time was if, if given a goal and given time, the amount of capital that energy companies can put towards this goal in a safe manner is so important. And so how do we kind of use these skill sets to kind of get towards this kind of transition? So I'd love to get a little nerdy, James, yeah. um, and just yeah. understand, you know, we, I've heard a lot about agrivoltaics, you know, this idea that you can combine agriculture, there's a lot of that here, with solar, also a lot of that here. How, you know, how, can you give us a sense of the, the, the state of that Yep. trend like is this is this a real thing is this happening anywhere is it you know, to what degree yep. uh, what are what are where might it go yeah um, so yes a lot of my research is in, is, is in agrivoltaics and so this is um, really it's such a place-based solution so like this is going to look different throughout the country but kind of like what we have seen in arid regions is the ability to grow different types of crops different times of the year with less water um, and that is huge, in particularly in these kind of like desert regions. And, and by the way, the, the actual changes to the climate actually lead to a little more power generation. So it's this dual benefit across all these sectors. Um, and so it's, you know, in particularly if you look at nature and in terms of like, the, these are these plants that grow in the shade of other areas, or um, we're talking to grape producers in Northern California that can no longer grow certain varietals of grapes because it is so warm. How can you take advantage of something that you're going to have to shade anyways, and you might as well get more money out of it at the same time, allowing farmers to kind of diversify their revenue? And so it's really, our role is really trying to figure out where does this actually make sense and not trying to tell people what to do. And so it's the, the is this technically feasible coupled with that? Um, and like another example of that is actually the, the wind industry in Texas. Um, I mean, just a good wind, wind resource access to like transmission, which was a kind of a Texas um, kind of mandate of them. But the other big one was getting cattle ranchers on board. And so they were actually able to not change any of their practices in their cattle ranching, but they were also then able to get money from the wind developers. And so I think it's capturing these, these, these like areas where everyone can kind of share these benefits is going to be very important for this. Yeah, and this this idea of layering value, right? So you have in the cattle in the cattle example, you you might even layer one additional point of value, which would be like rotational grazing practices to do additional carbon yep. storage in that soil, which you could capture credits against. You could credit mm -hmm. that. So that's where you had one revenue stream. Perhaps you have three, and perhaps you have better output, you know, in the process. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but where are, where is this, are we actually doing agrivoltaics at scale or mm -hmm. it, 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 can you give us a sense of yeah. where are we like on that? I think it, I think it depends on your, your definition. So right now I think the, we are seeing the grazing of sheep underneath solar panels fairly, mm -hmm. fairly pro predominantly throughout the United States. Um, crops more so, um, in Europe, mm -hmm. um, at a, at a kind of like a larger scale for more kind of high value crops, um, but this is something that is of interest, and it's the, the how do you, basically, again, we get back to these trade-offs of costs versus right. food production versus land production. And so I think it's a trend that is emerging, um, but it's not quite there yet. And that, to me, is really where kind of federal investment, and you know, that's kind of what we see with the DACA as well, something that we know can possibly be a good idea, but it needs that like just little push 
yeah. kind of get it onto that trend. So let's talk about that little push, which is actually a fairly large push to the tune of many billions of dollars that are flowing through Department of Energy. And so I'd love to ask you, um, uh, Terabai, if you could reflect on maybe what you could think of as another trend, another trend that's emerging, which is the changing relationship between the Department of Energy, the national lab system, and private industry. So, you know, this this sort of unprecedented pieces of legislation recently that have unlocked all of this value. What is this? What does this portend? Like, what what is this new relationship? Where is it going? And how should we think about it between DOE, national labs, and opportunities for industry? Um, okay. Um, so I think uh, if if there was to be an imperative for the DOE right now it's to lay down the foundation for this energy transition. And I think they've passed two laws, not one, that are going to put about a billion dollar, uh, a trillion dollar, I should say, into the economy to, to do just that. And I think that is, that makes it uh, urgent that we act now to take advantage of that. Um, so from a national lab perspective, our funding for the past decades had been really focused on innovating and understanding uh, at fairly low TRL level from an R&D perspective, what are the, the viable solutions going forward? And right now what the DOE is asking us to do is to push technology out of the lab and into the economy. But we are not going to be the people that build this economy. You guys are. I think the companies represented here today are going to be the, com the companies that build the systems that are going to power this energy transition. We can only help you, and this is why I'm here, actually. We have a relationship now with Cal State Bakersfield, which we are very excited about. We want to engage with people in the community that want to participate in this exciting, I'm going to call it revolution, uh, it's, it's because I feel like by the time it's done and we look back, it's going to look significantly different from what we're looking at today. So transition is, uh, I, I don't know if transition is actually captures how profound this transformation will be when we finally do it. And one of the things... Can you, can you say more about that? What do you mean by that? Uh, I mean that... Uh, you know, right now, from where I sit, even though I have been in this space for years and years, it's, it's hard for me to imagine what the future will be. I really don't know what it's going to be because uh, some of the technologies we need don't yet exist. Mm -hmm. and so we, we've yet to invent them. And if it's difficult for me, I expect it will be difficult for a lot of people. And, and so I think this is really a moment in time that the, DOE, that the DOE is trying to put in place a footprint that people can look at and say, oh, I don't have to imagine this anymore. I know what it's going to look like. And I don't think that the, gov the money the government is going to put into this is going to solve the problem. But hopefully what it will do is it will actually lay down this, this foundation that we can all look at and begin to understand how our solutions plug into this amazing, complicated machine. So you, you sit over a number of different research areas within the lab. Um, you have visibility into the carbon capture projects that the lab is, is working on. And you and I were talking earlier, and you were saying, even by the day, we're seeing improvements in terms of the rates of capture, in terms of the efficiencies of these technologies. So I'm wondering, from an industry perspective, how does industry say, OK, all right, let's choose that one. We're going to go with that instead of waiting for tomorrow yeah. when we might have something better, you know? Like, because these are major capital, you know, capital intensive projects, Agreed. right? So how do you make that call? And, you know, how would you, from your perspective, you know, how should people who have to deploy this stuff think about this moment that we're in from that perspective? Um, okay, so I think that uh, right now, the one thing we should not do <laughs> is let perfect be the enemy of good. Uh, you know, if, uh, I, if you look at my cell phone, it has a chip inside, and when we designed the first chip, we didn't say, we got it, we're done. We, 
we, can, we continue to innovate, we continue to make it better. I actually think the energy transition is exactly the same. I think what we should do now is take the best solutions available and implement them and go from there. And I think uh, the opportunity now, what, what I have come to learn, and in many ways right here in Bakersfield I learned this, is that this transition is not going to be powered by the largest corporations. They will, they will have a role in it. But what's amazing to me is how many small companies have great ideas and they're trying to bring them to market. And I really think this is amazing. And I think that this funding from the DOE is the perfect way to de-risk investments and to help these companies pull themselves by the bootstraps and, and push their technology out to where it's actually useful. And as a national lab, we can play a role in that. And so if somebody here in the audience uh, have an idea, you don't know how to work with the DOE, you should reach out to us, we can help you. If you don't have a deep scientific bench and, and there is a technological niche that needs to be solved in order for to, your technology to be viable, we can probably help you with that. And so I am reaching out to you guys. Uh, we are here to help. Uh, we are not motivated by profit. We are motivated by helping the United States be the first country, be a leading country in the world in, uh, in, in, in implementing this energy transition. Because what that does is, and, and the motivation doesn't have to be tree-hugging or you know, uh, solving the climate problem. It can be about jobs, like it is in Kern County. It can be about our economic competitiveness in the world. And I think it's really important for us to do it. And other countries are nipping at our heels. Uh, the national labs are a resource. The country invests in us. We actually spend taxpayer dollars to exist. Let us help you. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, okay, last quick question. Um, you know, there's this great quote from 1931, Thomas Edison, where he said, you know, I put my money on solar. What an amazing source of power. And we're f sort of finally getting around to doing that in terms of power generation. Yep. And I'm just curious, what other technologies are hiding in plain sight like that? You know, because it was pretty obvious given, I mean, the this, this sun which powers everything on this planet, right? Um, huge amount of power available there. What are some of the other technologies that might be kind of hiding in plain sight where, you know, 50 years from now we look back and say, wow, okay. should have thought of that, maybe done that sooner. <laughs> um, so I, I have my favorite, other people might have theirs, but, but before I talk about it, I want to, uh, this is really aspirational at this point, but I think fusion energy could really unlock unlimited potential. And almost exactly a year ago, how many, how many here have heard of the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Lab? Okay. And so you probably heard the shot heard around the world, um, where we actually, for the very first time in human history, achieved fusion in, in the laboratory. We have been at this for about 50 years. We started the idea was uh, proposed shortly after lasers were invented in 1961. And for the past 50 some odd years, we've been working to achieve fusion in a lab, and it proved to be much harder than we thought. Uh, and so, uh, but to say that we are able to do that in a lab, that we are still far away from achieving, and, and by the way, uh, getting back to the, to, to the quote that you, you just mentioned, uh, fusion is exactly the reaction that powers the sun. So, so this is really interesting, and um, we st there is still a lot of innovation that needs to happen. So this is not, this will not, okay, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not giving everybody a free pass. Let's forget solar, let's forget wind, let's forget energy transition and wait for fusion. We absolutely should not do that. But, but the thing that's going to happen, and this was mentioned earlier, is that our insatiable appetite for energy is only going to grow bigger. And, and I think more sources of clean energy are going to be needed for our children and their children. And I think fusion, I would see fusion in that context, yeah. but it's a really exciting development. 
and it will be a game changer when we finally get there. Yeah, James. Um, can I say ditto? Sure. No, no. Um, <laughs> and with um, that? No. Uh, I mean, actually, I'm a bit more of a technology skeptic. Um, I think if my printer makes a loud noise, I look at it sideways the rest of the day. Uh -huh. um, I think that we have the technology that we need to achieve this transition, and it's just about deployment in the right way. Um, mm -hmm. And it's truly the, you know, the all of the above, geothermal, um, water, uh, wave power, wind, solar, and it's basically how do we actually do this in an economic manner. Yeah. Well, thanks very much to our panelists, and thank you all. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks.